morning, Pastor Ed here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey with daily devotions for Saturday, August the 7th, 2021. This week we've been talking about trusting in God. Um, and we've also heard, as we did on Monday, uh, the story uh, about uh, the Israelites being fed in the wilderness, the manna and the quail, and that's part of the, the whole nature of trusting in God, the story of uh, how God led the Israelites not only out of slavery in Egypt, but, but, but in the journey through the wilderness to the promised land. Uh, of course, we've been focusing on Sundays and also in our uh, weekly daily devotions a little bit on the uh, John 6 and the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. So this all kind of fits together. And again, under the umbrella of trust. Um, but it's interesting. We, we pick that up once again in Psalm 78, which is today's reading. Uh, but we have a little bit of a different uh, twist on it, I guess you might say. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But before we begin that, let's begin with the uh, service of responsive prayer, namely the uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and Martin Luther's Morning Prayer. Let us begin. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give, you, we give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you protected us through the night from all harm and danger. We ask that you would also protect us today from sin and all evil, so that our life and actions may please you. Into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Well, our reading this morning is from psalm 78 verses 23 uh, to 29 and as you listen to them uh, you'll recognize that it's kind of a retelling um, the psalms again were sort of the, uh, the the hymn book of the israelites and so here's a hymn uh, encapsulating and and you know sharing that story the well-known story of of the wilderness and god providing food uh, for his people it begins in verse 23, again, Psalm 78. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Mortals ate of the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens, and by his power he let out the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall within their camp all around their dwellings. And they ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. Talked a little bit again early in the week about manna and how it formed. And, and you know, it, it, when it dried in the morning, it was kind of like a flaky substance. Um, uh, they asked, what is this? In Hebrew, man who? And so it's manna. It's basically the, the name of it is, is, is that question. And then the quail, that is a... A natural phenomenon that the uh, the the birds sometimes flying in that region or get so tired that when they they stop to rest they're they're easily um, captured and used for food. So um, both of these things happen naturally, and yet um, through the lens of faith, as I talked about the other day, they were seen as being uh, signs of uh, of of God's intervention on their behalf. 
the interesting thing about seven, Psalm 78 is it's like, like close to 70 verses, something like that. This is sort of tucked in the first half of it. Um, but the overall message of the psalm is not simply about what God has done for, you, for them, but, but how they responded to it and in, in many ways kind of rejected it. So the psalm actually begins like this. So I'm going to go through and touch on some of these, some of these verses. Um, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old things that, that we've heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We'll not hide them from their children. We'll tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. So far, so good. That the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, rise up and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. So far, so good. And, but here it begins to change. And they should not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. They forgot what he had done and the miracles that he had shown them. And so then it talks, it kind of recounts that story in the wilderness and God leads them by the, uh, uh, the, the, the cloud during the day and, the, and the, the fiery light by night. He splits rock in the wilderness and gives them water. Um, the psalm picks it up in verse 17, yet they sin still more against him rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart by demanding the food that they craved. They spoke against God. Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Even though he struck the rock so that the water gushed out and torrents overflowed, can he also give bread or provide meat for his people? And therefore, when the Lord heard this, he was full of rage because they had no faith in God and did not trust his saving power. That's verse 22. So our reading picks up there, yet he commanded the skies, opened the doors of heaven, rained down them manna to eat, caused the winds to blow, and rained uh, winged birds like the sand of the seas. Okay, so if you just take that, well, that's great. That's recounting the wonderful things that God has done, but what's leading up to it is that the people were, were, were complaining. But before they had, then picking it up, then after our reading, before they had satisfied their craving, while this food was still in their mouths, the anger of God was against them. In spite of all this, they sinned. They still did not believe in his wonders. And so he made their days vanish like a breath, their years in terror. When, they, when he killed them, they sought for him. They repented and sought God earnestly. They remembered that God was their rock, the most high God, their redeemer. So they were, they were punished. There were deaths. They saw that as, I guess, punishment. Uh, from God. So now they remember what God has done and they repented. Okay, but then verse 36, but they flattered him with their mouths, but lied to them, him with their tongues. Their heart was not steadfast toward him. They were not true to his covenant. And yet he, meaning God, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Often he restrained his anger and did not stir up all his wrath. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. And then later on in the story, when he you know, gives them the promised land, he drove out nations before them. He apportioned for them a possession, settled the tribes of Israel in their tents. And yet they tested the Most High and rebelled against him. They did not observe his decrees. And then it goes on to its conclusion. So this, this little section sort of in the, the first third, towards the end of that first third, it's all about the wonderful things that God has done and he has done more. They're all recounted here, but what also is recounted is the shameful truth that the people were not faithful. The people whined and, and complained. Um, we've talked about this before, I think, some months back about about complaining. There's a, a story I think I shared at that time, Edward Skidmore, uh, writes, my brother-in-law Bob works in the San Angelo School District, and he said that one day a bunch of his staff were carpooling to go from one place to another for a, for a meeting, and when he got in his truck, a guy he didn't even know jumped in the passenger seat next to him and said, I'm riding with you. You're the only one of these guys who doesn't complain about everything. Um, 
So Skidmore says, you want to shine like a star in the universe, then to be one of those rare individuals who doesn't whine and complain and find fault with everything around you. As much as anything you, as much as anything you do say, it's what you don't say that can shine the light of God in a dark world. And then he quotes Philippians 2, verse 14. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the wilderness. But that's not what the Israelites did, of course. As, as one fellow said, with victory fresh in their minds, uh, the Israelites um, there in the wilderness at the very beginning um, encountered a problem. They didn't have water. What water they did find was bitter. Um, John Piper, in his book, A Sweet and Bitter Providence, says about life, life is not a straight, straight line running from one blessing to the next and then finally to heaven. Life is a winding and troubled road switchback after switchback. Well, in 1991, a fellow by the name of Robert Hughes, an art critic, wrote a book called The Culture of Complaint. His thesis was that we live in a culture in which we perceive ourselves as being entitled to having all of our wants and desires fulfilled. This kind of sounds like the Israelites, doesn't it? And when that doesn't happen, we become victims. We whine and complain and grumble. If we see it as somebody else's issue that's caused our inconvenience, then we sue that person or that institution. And so the question is, you know, um, are you disappointed in life? Um, it's real easy uh, to be content and when things are going well. Um, but like the Israelites, when life turns bitter, we often become disappointed. God wants the, us, though, to teach us to be content, not just when things go our way, but also when they don't. That same John Piper uh, said the, the point of biblical stories like Joseph and Job and Esther and Ruth is to help us feel in our bones, not just know in our heads, that God is for us in all of these strange turns. God is not just showing up after the trouble and cleaning it up. He's, he's plotting the course, managing the troubles with far-reaching purposes. The more we know God, the more thankful uh, we will be. In another book, Exodus and Revo Revolution, Michael Walzer shares three lessons we can all learn from the Exodus event of the Old Testament. Um, what the Exodus taught first is that wherever you live, it's probably Egypt. And second, that there's a better place, a world that's more attractive, a promised land. And third, that the way to that land is through the wilderness. Normally, he says, we would say that God can change uh, your circumstances, but perhaps we should be seeking to change the way we perceive our circumstances. Sadly, throughout their history, the Israelites never, ever really trusted God. They had their moments, but on the whole, they chose their own destiny, and often it was one of rebellion um, and disobedience, and as we heard once again about whining and complaining, the sense of entitlement, you know, why have you you know, let us out here. You know, they, they cried out for freedom. God freed them. And, well, why would you free us so that we'd just die in the desert kind of a thing? Um, and so um, this Michael Walzer says, let us not uh, fall into the same pattern, but learn to be content in all things. The more uh, that we know God, the more thankful we will be. Trusting in God is trusting that even in difficult times, God is still with us. Um, doesn't promise us that it's all going to be rosy. Doesn't promise us or mislead us that, you know, it's always going to be easy, uh, that there aren't going to be troubles along the way. There aren't going to be challenges, and some of them downright um, overwhelming at times. But God promises that no matter what, He is, that God is with us, um, will comfort us, strengthen us, uh, protect us, give us hope. And that's the kind of trust we're talking about here. Not trusting that God's going to make everything okay, perfect for me, but that no matter what happens uh, to me or to you, that God is, God is with us. Somebody once said to Martin Luther, was complaining, um, 
you know, about something that had befallen them and said, why me? How many, how many times have we heard people say that? Why me? Or, or maybe we've asked that ourselves, why me? And, uh, and Luther's response was something to the effect of, why not you? Um, there's no guarantees that everything is, is going to be perfect in our lives. On the contrary, life is full of, of difficulties and pain and, and sorrow and even tragedy. The promise, the guarantee, that no matter what happens, God is with us. Well, let's close this morning with uh, the prayer we've been using for this week. Dear God, help us to trust that through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you give us the bread of life that feeds us and cares for us now and always. Amen. Well, hope you, as always, have a great weekend. Um, get a chance to, I, I don't know um, what you have planned, but I hope you have some plans, or if it's just to rest and relax, that you do that. Uh, and look forward to seeing you in worship uh, tomorrow and back here with Daily Devotions on Monday. Until then, take care and be well. Bye-bye.